Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan and the Janian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is architect Buzz Udell and author Rosa Lowinger. Architect Buzz Udell was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. He attended Pomfret School in, in Connecticut, Yale College, and the Yale School of Architecture. He served as a professor at UC Berkeley and UCLA. He's been a visiting critic in architecture at Technical University of Nova Scotia and the University of Austin in Texas. You also were a critic at your alma mater, Yale. Uh, is that when you became associated with Charles Moore? I actually first <coughs> met Charles Moore when I was in my very first year of graduate school. And he taught a wonderful studio there, and we sort of bonded. And then that was the beginning of a, of a very long relationship. And because it's difficult. I mean, there's so many architects and so many students mm -hmm. going through school to, mm -hmm. to actually catch the eye of the person who's in charge of the, of the right. department. Yeah, that's true. But it, what was interesting about Charles is that he, he was very much a mentor. And he really liked working with young people. And uh, in, in fact, he preferred teaching the first year studio instead of the third year. Oh, he did. Yeah, because he thought <coughs> by the, but you know, the later on they go, the more set in their ways. <laughs> and he wanted very sort of fresh, innocent people. Enthusiastic. So enthusiastic what was the uh, association with Tina Beebe? That's an in interesting question relative to Charles, because Tina, who's my wife now, and- Oh, and she is your yeah, wife. Yeah, oh. And collaborator, and uh, is a graphic designer, a colorist, a uh, painter, gardener. I knew her as an artist. Yeah, That's why I was yeah. asking what the- And she had independently worked for Charles actually before I worked for Charles, between her <coughs> college and graduate school. And then we actually met because of Charles. Oh. So it's kind of a family almost. And when when you do, I, I saw some of the drawings you do and mm -hmm. they're colored. Does mm -hmm. she do those colorations? Yeah. Tina really is our colorist on all of our major projects and works not only on applied color, but integral color and nature of materials and the whole palette. Yeah, it, just, it looked like there was an artistic hand yeah, at work in yeah, that. And, yeah. and from your drawings, I'm going to show a picture of that from your mm -hmm. book. But you talk about this long commitment of people. How do people stay partners for so long? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's unusual. I think there's a couple of reasons. When Charles, as a mentor, was very much <laughs> a collaborator. And the relationships were both professional and became personal, too and very much invited people in. And w we, we talk about the way we collaborate as being like a jazz ensemble that uh -huh. we kind of share rhythms and share ideas, but take turns in the lead almost. And so it's almost like- Oh, is like that what happens? Yeah. You come back and forth yeah. like, a, yeah. like a musical group. Very much group. like a musical group. And <coughs> what happens though with that is that it, I think it's partly a, something that people have certain empathy for and it's partly learned. And the more you do it, uh, in our case, the more gratifying it becomes. So you tend to kind of build more and more bonds. So um, it, it's it's lasting. It's self <laughs> self perpetuating. <laughs> perpetuating yeah. Yeah. My partner John Rubel is I've been working with since '76, and I met him because of Charles. Um, when you were a child, did you want to build things? Were you always building things? I did build things. What was interesting is I had I was very lucky. I had science influence from my father who was a, a physician and a researcher um. and my mother was an artist and a, a, a modern dancer and that was uh, so all of those were around the house so i i built contraptions but i also made models of uh, sections through the heart and the eye for science projects but i was always making them you were always making things yeah. um it's really difficult it was really difficult for me to write these notes and to keep calling you Buzz because <laughs> they didn't know you and I thought this is such a distinguished architect <laughs> doing all this work all over Asia and Europe and the world and I'm calling him Buzz is that <laughs> no in, in fact I've, I, I've had that since before I was even conscious 
And when people, historically, when, when people call me Robert, I sort of look around wondering who they're talking to. Okay, and, well, so, it's okay to so call absolutely. you, but <laughs> um, architects, as we were talking, take different paths mm -hmm. um, once they get started. I don't know if they, you seem to, in your work, look at house and home as a community, just exactly. how you were discussing your partnership. Exactly. I mean, we, we <coughs> began with houses, and we've always been very much involved in um, collaborating I'll show these while you're with our clients. And the house you're showing now was for Peg Yorkin and her two grown children. So actually, it was very much, in that, that example, it was very much a group of people creating a community house for them and working very, very closely. So there were a lot of people living in this. Yeah, it became. And this is a view from what side? That's a view from the, the Pacific Coast Highway, um, where there was a need to kind of both bring light in, but also to, to create sort of a series of buffers or courtyards from the noise on the highway. And we have another one that's taken from the beach side. Yeah, and on that side, the, the house is quite protected on the highway side, and then the entire house opens up, uh, virtually Onto all the, the walls. Beach almost every wall slides open. So you feel literally like you're on a <coughs> the deck of a boat when you're inside. You can completely open up the house or slide it closed. How much in. input would, uh, say, the owner have? A, a lot. We, we really <laughs> embrace. We think of, of architecture as, in a sense, being a kind of dynamic balance between the site and, it, and the climate, the building itself, and then the people who inhabit it. So a tremendous amount of involvement. And, and here's another. This is Sea Ranch. Yeah. And I guess that's totally different because it's, it's in it, a different site. Exactly. In a site where, this is actually our, uh, Tina's in my house uh, on, in, at the Sea Ranch, which is planned about around environmental principles. So it, it's oh. all about native landscape uh, houses that sort of feather themselves into the into the landscape. And we have that at night yeah. also. And then it becomes we? kind of a lantern <coughs> at night with our two studies as these kind of little uh, Romeo and Juliet towers, if you will. And then the, the, the whole house comes together around a courtyard. So it's that same idea of... And what kind of bring, material is that? Um, this is all um, uh, redwood on the outside and various woods on the inside. It's very much a house that's <coughs> uh, about the local materials. That fits that exactly. area. So when you talk about community, you're building, how you're building buildings in in Asia mm -hmm. and Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you take that to a big building? That feeling? Uh, you know, that's <coughs> a very important question because a lot of large Is buildings lose the sense of scale or the sense of individuals, especially that's housing. That's right. I think one of the reasons we've been sought out in places like and this is Sweden. And then now in Asia is that what kind of building is this in Malmo? Th this is actually a, was part of a um, international exposition on innovative housing with uh, focusing on sustainable technologies. So but each I I they look like separate units. Yeah, each there's a series of flats and duplexes, but these are the kind of main living spaces that become south-facing kind of lanterns that are open to this to the sun. Uh, but then they share this garden. Um, which is, again is, is a garden that has a lot of sustainable features, but I think th it was interesting to take the technology but also humanize it, uh, and that gets again back to how people live together. Because this must be a wave of the future because th of space I th I th this and land. This project actually has become mm -hmm. a kind of uh, pilgrimage. People are coming from all over the world. Is this to part of it yeah. too? Yeah, and this is just a, a detail that shows the green roofs, the solar panels, and just, we like this image because you can see the man who's claimed this porch as his domain and uh -huh. how an individual can occupy it and have a powerful sense of individuality within the sense of community or balanced by community. Well, talking about community, when you've done so much work on campuses, <laughs> you've, uh, you have, you've built on UC Santa Barbara, Caltech, University of Cincinnati, Dartmouth, MIT, how do you connect? Do you d build new buildings or you connect to the old buildings? We do uh, probably more new buildings than old, but we've, we also do hybrids, which are new pieces and old that link. And uh, I think that image that you're picking up is on the left is um, one side of a, a very long um, terraced uh, student life center with a series of, of student so organizations. So this is a new building. Yeah. But it bridges over, I don't know if, if it's a little hard to see it, in the distance it bridges over and creates an atrium linking to an old building. So 
we very much like, we think of buildings as being in a dialogue with our neighbors, so. That's what I wondered, yeah. especially it's difficult to go in and you can't tear down the old buildings mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're venerable. They've yeah. been there since the Ex universities uh, exactly. started. It's Did a, you try to replicate the material? No, we, we tr well, what we try to do is, is have a fresh interpretation that's uh, very much contemporary, but still one that's respectful of, in that case, there are certain proportions or certain colors and palettes, but it's its own sort of new interpretation of the times. And Let's um, talk about this, because this is the project at uh -huh. UCLA. Right. And did the committee approve this? This, we had a, <laughs> this was uh, fascinating. Uh, it, it, as you, I think you know, it's the World Arts and Culture, which is this cross-disciplinary, cross, you know, transnational program of arts and dance and folklore. And we had the most wonderful client group, because they go from avant-garde, like Peter Sellers, to folk art or material oh, culture. Oh, so you had to deal, deal with all of them? The entire <laughs> spectrum. And they were wonderful because they were just passionate about what Here's they were doing. Here's the, um, the dance Yeah, studio. this is a new, uh, what we call the Garden Pavilion, one of, one of the Kaufman pavilions. And this is a very flexible space that uh, can go from just a practice studio to a pavilion that... Is uh, this it right here? Uh, actually, that's the interior. That's new the theater. interior. This, this becomes a pavilion that can flow out into the garden or, or be self-sufficient. And here's the and same this, thing this is the, the Gloria Kaufman uh, main theater. Oh, this is the main yeah, theater. Yeah, which is what was really interesting about that, and one of the reasons we brought the model is that it's in a, the old women's gym from 1929, so <gasps> we had to respect oh. the entire shell. Oh, so that's we yeah. have this the model on the set, just a working model, mm -hmm, exactly. and you can see the truss, right? Which is original. Is that right? Yeah. So what we had to model very carefully all the original windows and. Uh, trusses and shapes, and then insert these very contemporary high-tech pieces that could accommodate uh, contemporary stagecraft and be very flexible and hopefully also quite beautiful. It, is it next to an old building? It's actually, this is in no, the, 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 oh, your, this whole the whole complex. complex. It's part of the whole UCLA historic core. So on two sides, there's uh, old so buildings. Is this the old building? That's the old building. This is the old building, that we're and then we saw. The, the Garden Theater is a new piece. I see on the back side. And this large theater that we have the model of is a, is, is a new piece because inside this. Because this says UCLA to it me. It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a classic, uh, one of their original eight buildings. And, and the other thing, uh, like if you were at MIT, mm -hmm. you would do the same thing? We would try always to sort of engage and, and talk to the other building, but not replicate it. I see. So and that's the thing. Yeah. That's the idea. To and you're sen and making a sense of community? Exactly. To be sort of a, a bridge. Um, between the, the existing conditions and, and the new aspirations of the place. And, and then, and you say you had a, a big client list. What, I mean, do you keep presenting things to everybody or what do you do? We, you know, it's interesting. We, we started as a small firm interested in houses and I think because of that interest in how we work and how we engage our clients, uh, then we went to the next scale and we, our university clients, um, seem to talk to each other, and, they, and, and <laughs> That's what so I mean. we, we've had uh, almost a self-perpetuating uh, body of work in. But you want them to talk to each Absolutely, other. Absolutely, especially, you know, when they're uh, happy as they seem to be. And I was looking for one of those drawings that had the color in it, oh, and I haven't that? been success. Oh, this, like yeah. this? That's just a quick conceptual sketch for a, a house for uh, uh, Mark Schmuger and Louise Hamagami. Um, but and you can see the color and the water. Yeah, the, the piece yeah. it turns into a piece of art. Yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah. So that would be Tina's work. Actually, this is one of my sketches. But um, Tina would then come in, and this is just a conceptual sketch. Very early on, she comes in and almost does paintings that's that start to <coughs> understand. That's what I was looking for yeah. in here. There's I one on the Swedish project in there. I, I you have to, you find to find it. Find that? Yeah. yeah. And then while I'm doing that, I wanted to show the um, the. Um, the embassy in Berlin you right. were working on as right. well. Right. And and that is in what? In the in the That's uh, in construction right now. It's r right next to the Brandenburg Gate. Yeah, so you look at the Brandenburg Gate and then you see the American embassy. Exactly. And yeah. All that. It's a and then in front of it is the Peter Eisman um, memorial. Um, so it, it's an extraordinary site. Actually. Did you work with a lot of architects? Did you ha did you have vocabulary w uh, talks with other architects? Um, w that was a competition. <coughs> that was a national competition. But I mean, we they're oh, all working there. Yeah, we have talked to. We've worked in Germany for a long time. So there's a 
a lively dialogue about you know the role of history, the role this of. This is of what history. I was talking that's about. That's a sketch. That's yeah. one of Tina's watercolors. Yeah. yeah. Um, that which is just very early on taking the concept of that really shows the idea of sort of individual house, but within a group context, and then color sort of tries to take that concept and take it to the next step and uh, became a kind of pivotal notion. It's been so great having oh, you with well us today, terrific. Buzz. Thank enjoyed you it. very it's much. It's a pleasure. I've enjoyed thanks, it. Thanks for, for being here. All and right. thanks for watching. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Rosa Lowinger and her book, Tropicana Nights. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with writer, art conservator, Rosa Lowinger, who was born in Havana, Cuba, and raised in Miami. She studied printmaking and sculpture at Brandeis University and earned a degree from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. What did you intend to do, Rosa? Were you going to be an artist? Well, I was going to be an artist originally, <laughs> yes. but then I really didn't have... Um, much of a sub uh, subject matter to deal with. I was technically <laughs> very skilled, but I didn't really have anything to say, so I took those skills and became an art conservator. That's pretty interesting. Do you go to art conservatory school? Yeah, NYU. Oh, you do? oh that's where they yes. had that program? the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. Oh, I thought you were continuing your art studies no, there. No, no, no. That was a training in art history and art conservation. Um. And then I worked at LACMA. And, and how much do you, well, Getting into art conserva sure. into the conservatory uh, part of what you do, how much do you depend on living artists? Do you do oh a great deal? Do in you? fact, you know my specialty is in contemporary art. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's I do outdoor sculpture and um, architectural detail, but my main interest is contemporary art. And I work a great deal with artists. And so they tell you what? Because well, you have to use them as... Um, you use them as a source of a certain type, but mainly what you want to know from them is, especially with the really contemporary work, is what their opinion is about preservation. Because very often it's not so much what they want to have done, but what their philosophy is about the nature oh, of their work. because sometimes they just want it to be ephemeral and yeah. come and go. Or sometimes, you know, like with, say, example, Donald Judd, where a certain type of pristineness is essential, that information was important always to have. To, to, to do that, like, yeah. finish sur And then certain other artists don't care, like, what happens if things fall apart, and you need to honor it depending on what the artist's point of view is. I always think it's so interesting because an artist makes a piece, don't you think he can go back and remake it? Well, this that's is what an, That's what I think, it's but it's not. an interesting question. Uh, there were, M Robert Motherwell notoriously liked to go in and repaint his paintings if, you know, he saw them. And of course, you couldn't let him repaint his paintings because then they're oh, different paintings. The attribution right. changes. Oh, is that what happens? Yeah. If you buy a painting by an artist and then yeah. they come to your house and they see their son, they want to repaint it. Right. If they repaint it, it's no longer the same artwork. It's not the same attribution. Um, or repair. What about repair? Same thing? Same thing with repair. Generally with repair, you don't want the artist to do the repair because very often they're somewhere else in their mind and they'll do something different and they'll change the work. That's so interesting. Do you go in, you, you teach at museums. I know I do you teach. work with museums, but you also have to teach their staff, yeah. don't you? I teach museum staff and I also work in some of the pro uh, conservation programs training our conservators. I was going to say, what do you, how do you train them? Are they just regular people, curators? Who oh, no, are no, they? No, no. Who, does, uh, who do our conservation? Our conservation is a very technically skilled profession. You need to have a lot of science, a lot of chemistry background, a lot of art history, oh. and there are graduate programs now. In fact, UCLA and the Getty just started the first one on the West Coast. And, and do you work with those people? Yeah, I'm teaching there in January. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I always find about that is people in museums think that they can, if something happens to a piece, don't Not they? Not just in museums. Like oh, people don't in people private, want yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Don't people want to just 
put a little scotch tape on it yeah. or glue it or do something? You know, it's, there's I a don't want to do that. There's but. a continuum. <laughs> it depends. It all depends on the more valuable the work, the more people are less apt to, the less people are apt to do that. They don't want to go near yeah, it. Yeah, because they, they know they can ruin things. And most often, a lot of the work that I do is undoing damage done by individuals who don't know what they're doing. Oh, that's interesting, too. Yeah. Well, all the while, while you were doing this conservation work, <laughs> your day job, were you writing? Well, I've been writing actually <laughs> since the, I guess it was like the early 90s. Um, and I wrote a play and I've written some fiction, but this book kind of fell into my lap. Tropicana Nights yeah. is what you're talking about. But you wrote a book, was it about, did it have Cuba as a background? Well, a I wrote novel? a novel, it didn't get published, but oh. I got I got my fabulous agent because of it, and um, yes, of course, Cuba. Cuba is sort of my subject matter to a certain extent, and it's just conservation. I'm working on a novel now where the protagonist is an LA-based art conservator. Oh, I wonder who. No, 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 not me, not me. <laughs> you wrote a play yeah. long ago, and it got produced off Broadway. It was the first thing I ever wrote that wasn't a piece of academic writing, and it happened by accident. But was it also influenced by Cuba? Oh yeah, it was. It took place oh, in Miami, yes. and oh. it was about it was about uh, three people involved in a business deal, but one of them was Cuban, and it was all about Miami politics and Cuba. That's pretty intertwined, Miami and Cuba. Oh. So it wasn't really. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising for me to see that you'd grown up in Miami. Right, right. <laughs> How did this Tropicana Nights come about? Oh, well, Tropicana came. Tropicana Nights came about because I was interested in the Tropicana Cabaret. It's a magnificent venue for people who don't know what it is. It's probably the most famous nightclub in the Western Hemisphere in the 1950s, and I through someone uh, that I met in Havana, I got the n phone number of the woman who's who was married to the owner of Tropicana in the 50s, and it so happened that she lives in Glendale. But what were you doing? Were you just visiting Cuba at the time? Oh, well, in the 1990s, I'm going to show used the to picture sure. of the, because there's a picture in your book of the Of the entry. entryway, yeah. yes. Um, in the 90s, when the government, the United States government, used to allow Americans to visit Cuba under what was called people-to-people -people exchanges, uh -huh. I used to take a lot of trips of Americans who wanted to visit Cuba for cultural reasons. Oh, you were taking them there. Yes. Did you still have family there? I don't have family there. My so family, you just went because you were... I used to take tours of Americans who wanted to see art and architecture, because that's my specialty. Oh. So I used to do the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. And uh, we were at Tropicana for the first time. I was there for the first time in the ni late 1990s, and I was just oh. astonished by the setting in particular because it's one of the most beautiful buildings in Cuba. Did the uh, let's talk about how it was sure. run because you you met up with this woman who lives in Glendale. Yes. She's Rosa as well. Oh no, she's Ophelia. Oh, she's Ophelia. She's Ophelia. Okay, her she, housemate is Rosa. Her, oh, okay. So she's Ophelia. Right. She was married to Martine Fox. Fox. Exactly the owner of Tropicana. And he had all these kind of like mafiosa people coming in. Were they really running the Tropicana Well, then? no, on the contrary. The, Cuba had dozens of nightclubs in the 50s, and all of them that had casinos were run by the mafia except for Tropicana. Oh, they were? They So they actually, oh, in yeah. Cuba, they oh, were yeah. being run. This is Sure, um, except for Tropicana. That's an important point because Martin Fox was so savvy at getting everybody to do things the way he wanted that he was friends with all these people. Uh, but they didn't run Tropicana. So Wilbur Clark from Las Vegas was down? Yes, was he was. There. Exactly. He was at the... Um, at the Hotel Parisien, at the Parisien Casino at the Hotel Nacional. And, oh, is that where he was? Yes, yes. And uh, Meyer Lansky? Lansky had his own club, the Riviera, he had the Riviera, the Copa Room at the Riviera, uh, well, the Riviera Hotel, oh. which is his dream project in Havana. That's and up on the top, the room at uh, the Riviera? That the Riviera room? Hotel, no, the Riviera Hotel in Havana. In Havana. Which, the Riviera Hotel in Havana, the nightclub, the, ca the casino and nightclub was in the f ground floor. Oh, I see. But first he ran the casino at the Hotel Nacional, and then he ran one called Montmartre, and then he <laughs> built that, um, his dream project, which he lost a year after he built it. Why did this become so famous? Why were the stars always there? Well, first of all, you have to understand that in the 50s, there was no door between Cuba and the United States. Americans flocked to Cuba, and uh, Havana was the place people went to party and gamble. Las Vegas was a, a you know, 
a two-bit town. <laughs> Las Vegas doesn't become important until Tropicana, until until the, after the Cuban Revolution. I love this because it has Steve Allen and Jane Meadows and Nat King Cole. I mean, they had everyone yeah. came to, to, yeah. to the Tropicana. Well, everybody came to Cuba, and everybody that came to Cuba went to Tropicana, not necessarily to perform, but to visit, because it was the single most important club in Havana. But everything went on there. It was like oh, a yeah. city. They made the costumes, the food. Uh, they were beating things. They were... Yeah, totally, totally. It had, in fact, after the Cuban Revolution, when the Castro government started opening nightclubs again, they used Tropicana's costume shop as the costume shop for all the clubs in the country. So everything was made there? It's post-revolution, but in, in the 50s, Tropicana had 400 employees. Can you it was, imagine? Oh, it was amazing. So and the music of the period was the music that everybody listened to, the mambo, the cha-cha-cha, that's what people cared and about. And it was more, this was the big, bigger than the Nationale, bigger than the Riviera? Oh, would absolutely. It say? Yes? I wouldn't say, oh yeah, it was bigger in size, but even more than that, it had a certain mystique because of its setting, it was outdoors. <coughs> it was um, this beautiful outdoor garden setting that no other place had. Had. And then in 52, this extraordinary building was built, which was a masterpiece of modern architecture, and it won many prizes. In oh, Cuba. it did? What, by a ar known architect? Or well, Cuban? a no known Cuban architect named Max Borges, who built this building that was essentially made to make the outdoors look like it was indoors. Oh, I see. It's just a gorgeous... Were you banned for writing this book? I may have been, but I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out next time I try to get into Cuba. <laughs> the because truth, some people yeah. were banned. Some journalists were banned for writing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The truth is that I try to <laughs> deal with the politics in a rather um, fair manner. The fact is that there were dictators in Cuba all along, and there still is a dictator right, in right, Cuba. Right, right. So how does Mar uh, Rose... Um, Ophelia. Uh, Ophelia. I keep calling her Rose. Ophelia feel about the book. Ophelia loves the book. It's, you know, it's her life. It's her life contained between those pages, the things that matter most to her. Was she going to write it in the first place? Well, she was keeping notes for writing something. And those, and that's that manuscript I refer to when I uh, talk about seeing something when mm -hmm. I first got there. It was about 50 pages of ruminations and some stories. What she had done. Right. But the book itself comes out of uh, a, a different... Energy. Of course, it comes out of the energy of art and architecture. Right, right. I was just, uh, when we were chatting a little while ago, we were talking about the Swedish uh, ambassador's house. Yes, yes, the Neutra House in Havana, which is uh, what all the architectural groups that went there in the in the late 90s wanted to see. It was a big deal because everybody wanted to go to the Neutra House. Yeah, what, what other houses like that were? Well, um, you know, of... of uh, of foreign architects, I couldn't tell you offhand, but Cuba, 1950s Cuba, was an area was a, was a was a time of incredible innovation in contemporary architecture because Havana's climate is really made for those types of freewheeling open interiors where you kind of have these curtain walls that open up to the outdoors, like the building in Malibu that, mm -hmm. um, that Buzz that was just yeah, talking yeah, about. Right. Um, Havana was just is just made for that, and 50s architecture in Cuba is absolutely glorious. Oh, you have been so interesting no, today. Thank, thank you. you, and I love this book. I'm going to go back and read it again because oh, I enjoyed it so much. Delighted to hear that. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. Bye.